Oh, All Raise is a nonprofit dedicated to amplifying female voices, accelerating female success, and creating a tech culture where women are leading, shaping, and funding the future. I just want to take a moment to quickly thank our sponsors and partners and all our volunteers who support us and help us make uh, events like these possible. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we're doing today. So thank you again to all of them. And before we jump forward, I do want to give credit where credit is due. Thank you to Natalia Gonzalez from Clout Capital, who introduced me to Juan Pablo and Lizbeth today. Um, just so, so excited to be able to leverage the network um, and continue to meet experts in the space. It's always a pleasure to do that. And I would love to introduce you to our speaker today. Uh, Juan Pablo believes in artists and entrepreneurs are like uh like, uh, like big ideas, big risks, risks, and a lot of think working alone. Since he can't draw or sing, Juan Pablo has focused on growing a more diverse and sustainable ecosystem. He started as a partner at Patagon.com when it moved to Miami in 1999 before being sold to Bronco Stander in one of the largest exits in Latin venture history. He recently co-founded New Life Health, a next-gen mental wellness company, and sold this company, Wonder.com, to Atari in 2020. Without further ado, over to you, Juan Pablo. Well, thank you so much. I really, um, this is really a uh, pleasure. Um, it's an area we've been um, very passionate about um, connecting um, entrepreneurs, diverse entrepreneurs and, um, and investors. Um, at the uh, law firm that, that we have, uh, PAG.law, with Lizbeth, um, who's joining us today, um, we help um, organize We Invest, which is the organization, um, not for profit, um, focused on connecting female investors throughout um, the Americas with the real focus on Latin America. So, any of your members who are interested in that organization, um, please feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, Liz is one of the co founders of our firm. Give her a quick introduction. Um, originally um, from Mexico or Mexican roots, studied at Harvard College, Harvard Law, um, and then worked at a um, large uh, US-based law firm's um, office in Brazil for eight or nine years. And for the last six plus years, um, she's been a partner with me. Um, our goal at the firm is just to um, help thousands of founders grow and scale their businesses while avoiding friction. Um, we're not really our focus isn't to um, sell legal services. And so with that, as you mentioned, um, what we're really um, focused on chatting about today, and I'm going to um, do a quick uh, uh, presentation and then um, we'll open it up to Q&A. So I encourage everyone who has questions, just um, include them in the, um, in the chat feature and we'll, we'll try to get to them. We'll include our emails at the end of the presentation. Um, and you can reach out to us directly. But what we've found with Liz, um, and we've, to give you an idea, we've advised over 700 um, entrepreneurs and their companies um, over the last seven years. So last year, um, we helped clients close about 100 rounds of financing, um, raising over $500 million. Um, and so, you know, we, we have a lot of experience and we see sort of the same issues come up over and over and over again. And that's really what we wanna help you guys avoid because nothing's more heartbreaking than um, seeing a founder whose company fails um, when it didn't have to fail. I always joke that um, by working with uh, great advisors like Liz, um, success is not obviously not at all guaranteed, but at least if you fail, you're not gonna fail for the wrong reasons. So, you know, you'll fail for the lack of product market fit or, you know, the kinds of things that you know, you're never going to feel good about failing, but at least you're not going to fail for a dumb reason um, and, and see the market take off and you be left behind. So what we're going to talk about today are the issues that come up during due diligence, um, because that's normally when an institutional investor is going to invest in a company. That's normally when um, we, we see these issues sort of initially appear. There's issues that we see over and over again with commercial agreements that earlier stage companies sign often without involving a, a seasoned advisor, um, ideally a lawyer, but a lot, a lot of times um, somebody on the uh, advisory board of the company who has experience could have helped the uh, founder 
or entrepreneur avoid um, issues that could ultimately sink their company. And lastly, we're going to just talk briefly about corporate governance um, issues, because as the um, market, um, it's interesting in the venture market, there are moments where the entrepreneurs have a lot of um, leverage, and then there's moments where the investors, where the money has leverage. I used to always joke that you know, venture tends to be uh, dictated by the golden yeah. rule, he who has the gold rules. But actually in the last two years, I'd say, and particularly coming out of COVID, the pendulum has really swung in favor of the entrepreneurs, a little bit like the housing market um, in Miami um, or in Austin, um, where it's become very much a seller's market. In venture, it's become very much an entrepreneur's market. And so you see some issues around corporate governance um, uh, beginning to raise their uh, their head. So as far as um, key issues that come up um, in due diligence rounds, and this is, this is as many of you know, you know often companies, um, you know, there's this joke that, you know, the initial money is raised from family, friends, and fools. That's often, you know, the pre-seed round. Um, people are investing on in a convertible note or a safe. The terms there, I'm sure you all know, very standardized, 20% discount. Um, uh, to the next round of financing, um, there's almost always a cap and a four to five percent um, sort of interest rate. So what ends up happening is you raise that money with almost no due diligence. Then um, you come to the Series A. Now you have a lead investor, normally an institutional investor, and that fund um, actually does some due diligence. And it's very interesting to me because the the funds are really just investing for three different focused on three different things, which actually are sort of two different things. One, the cap table, making sure that um, it's very clear who owns what stake in the company. And there's no debate about that because almost what's certain to happen is once a company um, does a series B round of financing where it's maybe raising five to $20 million, if, if there's any um, uh, issues regarding the cap table, suddenly those issues are gonna end up with a lawsuit of somebody claiming that they had an interest in the company when they didn't. Um, and then the next sort of category of uh, concerns for investors have to do with intellectual property, um, in the, in, often in the form of inventions and assignment agreements, and intellectual property generally. What a lot of entrepreneurs don't sort of realize is there's very standard documentation that um, they're gonna be asked to sign up for. The typical thing when an entrepreneur is raising, you know, around under two or three million dollars, but a priced equity round, there's um, this standard set of documentation, Series Seed. You can find it at SeriesSeed.com. Sort of an open source set of documents that a lawyer named Ted Wang prepared from Cooley when he was still practicing law. Um, and what this documentation, it's very simple documentation, literally almost fill in the blanks. Um, but this documentation includes the reps and warranties, uh, excuse me, the reps and warranties that the company is going to be asked to sign up for. So it is sort of interesting because notwithstanding the fact, probably about 50% of the time, our clients um, come to us you know, once they've already signed a term sheet or to help us negotiate the term sheet. And when we ask them about, hey, how are things set up for due diligence? There's sort of either panic or silence <laughs> is, tends to be the two reactions we get. Um, and both of those reactions sort of demonstrate to me that the entrepreneur doesn't really know what's gonna be asked of him or her. And um, it's actually very easy to know what, what you need to provide in terms of due diligence and what you need to be willing to be able to state. Because literally, if you go to the seriesseed.com documents, you download the um, stock investment agreement, section two are the reps and warranties of the company. And if you just go through the reps and warranties, you can sort of say, okay, yes, we, we have that. Oh, we don't have that. We need to get that. And so literally it's almost as if a professor, if you're not to bring up any you know, nightmares that people had about school, but it's almost like if you were preparing for an exam and the professor told you in advance what he or she's gonna be asking. And that's really what you have. 
um, in the Series C documents. Similarly, even for more late stage rounds, the National Venture Capital Association has their standard set of investment documents. And so the typical sort of thing you see with investments is pre-seed rounds um, and seed rounds tend to get funded on safes and convertible notes. Um, the safe is a standard Y Combinator document. The, the uh, convertible note that people tend to be using, there's a open source convertible note that um, Cooley, the law firm Cooley has put online um, on their Cooley Go website. A lot of um, early stage founders just use that form. We think it's fine. Um, then for priced equity rounds, you have the Series C.com documents, and then you have the NVCA form documents. The Series C.com documents are about 25 pages, very skinny, um, but very efficient. The NVCA form documents are sort of, I don't know, an inch and a half of paper. You definitely need to um, hire a, an experienced lawyer to help you get through those. But again, if you want to know what um, kind of due diligence questions and um, representations you're going to be asked to make, I always recommend that um, um, entrepreneurs just look at the uh, stock purchase agreement. Um, so, so anyway, that's the issues that come up during diligence. The, the next thing I wanted to just touch upon briefly is commercial agreements. One of the things we see over and over again with commercial agreements that get signed is client, especially in the world of SaaS solutions, a lot of clients um, and companies we're advising really want to sort of launch. And so there are FinTech, um, this happened to me uh, just a few weeks ago, a client had come to us, they're a FinTech, they want to do um, they want to do money transfers to Latin America using crypto, whatever. Um, and, you know, we laid out for them sort of, hey, you need this license and that license and you need to be a money transmitter and there's a federal license. And, you know, we laid out all the sort of regulatory hurdles they needed to think about. They thanked us. They went and signed a commercial agreement with a third party where they outsourced all of that. And so they thought this was amazing because they basically said, hey, we just saved ourselves whatever, fifty, dollars $100,000 of legal and regulatory fees, um, six months worth of licensing. And, you know, we've got, we've, we've sort of um, uh, jump-started ourselves into, uh, into business. And, you know, in 30 days um, for a relatively small fixed fee and transactional fee, we're able to, you know, start, you um, uh, developing our business. That sounds great. However, as I pointed out to them, I said, yeah, but if you look at the agreements you signed, you don't own your customers and you don't own your customer data. So in essence, you're, yes, it's, I think it's great to allow um, not to have to build all of the back end for your business. But the problem is if all you are is a front end, if all you are is basically a marketing platform, and you don't own the customer and you don't own the customer data, um, what value are you really creating that an investor is gonna invest into? Um, and, and when I said that, you could again, sort of hear the entrepreneur um, get very quiet as she digested what I had just said. Um, she agreed that um, she had made a mistake and now we're actually in a situation where we're trying to renegotiate that commercial agreement to turn it on its head to basically turn the um the the third party SaaS company into a service provider rather than us essentially being a customer distribution arm of their product which has been sort of white labeled to us so anyway i just mentioned that because a lot of especially early stage entrepreneurs again trying to jump start their business and trying to get into business um, very quickly, don't realize how important those issues are. Um, one thing I would mention um, is with entrepreneurs, the other mistake uh, that we see often is, and we're all for entrepreneurs, we understand bootstrapping, we're all for entrepreneurs trying to do it themselves. Um, there are certain things you can sort of do yourself and be fairly successful and other things where if you're working with the right advisor, um, literally a 10 minute conversation, a 15 minute conversation here and there where, you know, you might end up spending a total of a thousand dollars over the course of a month or two getting um, your documents in order um, 
is really worthwhile. So what there are today are there are these US legal forms um, where you can get a lot of the standard documentation, even, you know, Clerky is a platform we like and use a lot. Um, they have templates of documents. Um, Clerky has a function where you can have your attorney um, or your advisor basically supervise the forms you're using. And if you're working with an attorney who works through Clerky, um, so for instance, our firm, lots of firms um, have the, um, are connected to the API and Clerky. The nice thing is we can actually suggest the documents that the founders should be using, whether they're the founders repurchase agreements or the inventions and assignment agreements. Um, and then we can also review those documents before they get sent out for signature. So I'm just pointing out that um, often founders can be a little bit penny wise and pound foolish, um, not consulting lawyers, because often what happens is they consult the wrong lawyer. Um, my view is if you're working with a law firm or a lawyer who isn't closing 20 to 100 um, venture financing rounds a year, you should find a, another advisor because venture is very, very specific and your general corporate lawyer doesn't doesn't have the expertise to really advise you. But a lot of times, because a uh, founder will start with the wrong lawyer, get billed a lot of money to sort of reinvent the wheel, then she is a little bit traumatized and suddenly you start trying to do everything themselves. And then in due diligence, a lot of those you know sort of mistakes come out. And so by using a platform like Clerky, US legal forms, whatever, and working efficiently with your lawyer, or advisor, you can you can often um, sort of spend very little money, but end up with documents which aren't going to raise issues in diligence. The one thing I did just want to mention that I see time and time again that companies don't have when a problem comes up is a employee policy manual. Again, many there are many sort of online resources to create a policy manual. Um, you don't have to spend a lot of money. It can literally be a weekend project that um, you or a co-founder or an employee, a summer intern can put together. You can run it by your lawyer um, or advisor. Um, but this is something that's very important, especially as I said, our goal as advisors is to help entrepreneurs grow and scale and avoid friction. And when there is a problem, you know, somebody misbehaves at the office, somebody, I don't know, gets pregnant, and you realize you don't have a maternity leave policy or paternity leave policy or what have you, um, you realize you're sort of improvising where the reality is if you had had a employee manual, you'd be uh, in a much better position to address any issues that come up. And it's the kind of thing that an institutional investor, even if you're a fairly early stage company, likes to see because it shows that you're thinking very proactively in terms of risk mitigation. Because again, Investors who are investing in these early stages um, uh, are really just focused on the cap table of the company, the intellectual property the company has or doesn't have, but that's why inventions and assignment agreements are so important. And then also making sure through the uh, due diligence representations and warranties in the investment documents that the company is doing a reasonable job of mitigating risks. And so by having an employee policy manual, you're, you're definitely signaling the right thing. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on corporate governance other than to say that, um, again, as companies um, are able to call the shots a little bit more, um, we're seeing that sometimes founders are resistant to giving away or at least having some more checks and balances within the company. And we think that's a mistake. Um, we've been through the cycles. I was there in 2000. We sold our company, um, Patagon, for $700 million in 2000. Uh, six months later, the NASDAQ had deflated 87%. Um, we were there in 2010, um, you know, where Citibank almost went under and, and venture, um, like every other asset class, was uh, uh, not doing very well. And basically, in the last 12 years, we've seen the needle move in favor of entrepreneurs and there's a lot of competitive deals going on. And so that's where um, uh, we start seeing issues around corporate governance. And so, you know, you've seen companies like Uber um, uh, run into big problems. We could argue Facebook um, would be 
worth a lot more money if it had better checks and balances. There's this example of a company, Ofo, ride sharing um, company in, in Asia, in China, which was worth $3 billion and six months later went bankrupt because of lack of corporate governance. Um, anyway, there's there are certain issues we see over and over again. Um, founders giving themselves extra voting rights, um, not raising, not have bringing in independent directors at the appropriate time um, and some other issues. One thing I would mention on director and board composition um, is um, that unfortunately founders of color and female founders um, are much more likely to get squeezed out of their company um, than traditional founders. And so as you build your board composition, um, I always say, yes, you wanna bring in um, some independent directors and not be afraid of checks and balances. But what's very important is that you um, focus on bringing in independent directors that really are a reflection of the, um, of the company and of who the founders are. So anyway, with that, I think we can turn to um, Q&A. Um, if anyone wants to talk also about fundraising and how um, we often use um, how we often use um, uh, uh, tech crunch, uh, crunch base as the tool to help for fundraising. We're very, um, we're very, very helpful. Um, we're very, you know, um, available um, to do that. So with that, um, I'm happy to um, start working through some of the questions. I see a bunch of you have. Uh, uh, yeah, I saw the typo in capitalization. I'm gonna have to uh, give my uh, my uh, my summer intern who helped me with the presentation a uh, little uh, uh, I don't know, take substitute an I for an A or something. Um, but anyway, we'll um, we'll we'll definitely share the uh, the resources again, the MVCA forms the um, seriesc.com documents and we'll 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 get those um, to you all so one question um, regarding a startup lawyer regarding a regional firm versus a national firm um, what i would say here is um, uh, there's there's good venture lawyers um, both at small platforms like ours at medium sized law firms and at venture firms the important thing is this is highly highly specialized area of the law it's actually interesting because the legal documents are easy. And so that's why um, a lot of lawyers who are general corporate lawyers can sort of try to play venture lawyer. The difference is a real venture lawyer um, will be able to give you a sense of where the market is. And the market changes almost month to month. Um, it's almost, you know, if you've seen, you know, NFTs get very popular, then maybe, or less popular, SPACs get very popular. And then you know there's some scrutiny. What's well, the same thing we saw, for instance, when safes um, came out, and that was basically Y Combinator's answer to um, the convertible note, which TechCrunch had basically innovated. And so the Y Combinator at the time was sort of Y Combinator versus TechCrunch, um, you know, Harvard versus Stanford kind of you know rivalry. And I think Y Combinator did not like that a lot of their companies were using the Techstars form convertible note to do financing rounds. And so Techstars came out uh, with, a, with their convertible note. And so Y Combinator, a year or two later, came out with the safe. And so there was this moment where like 80% of debt deals were being done by safes. And then investors sort of realized that safes are actually less good for investors than a convertible note. And then predictably, now probably 25% of deals um, are done on safes or debt deals are done on safes. And, and um, sorry, 25% are done on safes and 75% are done on convertible notes. And so if, if you're working with a, with a uh, startup lawyer who just doesn't have the experience in terms of seeing almost on a daily basis the way the market's evolving, they're not going to realize that safes today are less commonly used than convertible notes. And so, as I said, I think, you know, regardless of the platform where your startup lawyer is working, um, I highly encourage you to work with a lawyer who's clearly doing 20, 50, 100 um, financing rounds a year rather than um, a lawyer who, um, 
you know, it doesn't have that kind of volume. The other thing I would just point out is sometimes um, entrepreneurs will focus on, on, hey, I want to work with, you know, whatever, X big firm, Silicon Valley firm, because they think that's important in terms of signaling to investors. Um, I, I don't think it's, it is very important. The one thing that happens um, with um, large firms sometimes, just to be careful, is you have to be very um, cognizant that their, their practice at big firms, it's literally, you know, they'll take 100 clients, um, hoping that one of those clients um, is the next big, big thing, right? And when they realize quickly that your, your company may not be the big thing, you may not be getting the A-team, um, to actually do the work. And so the other thing I really recommend to, you know, all my friends who are shopping for advisors, whether it's CPAs, accountants, um, um, or, or law firms, is really make sure who you're hiring, um, because you're ultimately hiring the lawyer. You want to make sure that lawyer or advisor is really going to be dedicated to your project. Um, and you're just not hiring their team, because if you're hiring their team, you may find that um, you, uh, you you end up dissatisfied. Liz, um, another question that's here. Um, wh when do you think it's an appropriate time to bring in directors? And maybe you could speak a little bit about um, how to um, best uh, build a um, advisory board and when's the right time to start thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So before you bring in uh, significant investors, uh, the board of direct, you should have a board of directors. And in fact, you're required by law in most states to have a board of directors as soon as you form any corporation. And in an LLC, it's called a board of managers. Same thing. It's the people who are uh, responsible uh, for the company. Basically, the buck stops with them. Uh, that's different from the officers. Um, so the CEO, uh, for example, and the CFO, all the C-suite officers, um, they serve under the board of directors. The board of directors answer to the shareholders. So at the beginning, um, you are really going to have you and your group of co-founders. Uh, you're probably not going to have a lot of other significant shareholders. Uh, then the board, uh, you should have a board, and the board should be comprised of your directors. Um, we always suggest uh, of your founders, rather. Um, your significant founders. We generally suggest that boards always have an odd number of members um, so that you avoid a deadlock. You always have a majority either one way or the other for all important corporate decisions. So you have a board from the beginning. Uh, what changes is once you start to bring in significant investors, in particular institutional investors, they will request uh, a board seat at some point. Um, to um, basically protect their investment. They wanna sit on the board. Um, they want to have a vote in the fundamental decision-making of the company. Um, and um, the, the slide uh, in Juan Pablo's presentation is very good because it sort of shows you over the lifetime of a company, as you raise funds, uh, the balance uh, shifts uh, little by little uh, from the founders controlling the board to the investors controlling the board. Um, the trick is not to allow that shift to happen too early. Um, in every round you raise, you really should only give up a board seat if it is a particularly significant investment. If you can avoid giving up a board seat, avoid it because you want the founders to control the board um, for as long as possible. It's really uh, not until let's say your series C or so that uh, the investors might start to uh, dominate the company. And um, it's quite um, common for the CEO to sit on the board. So therefore the CEO is an employee of the company, um, is serves at the discretion of the board, but also might have a board seat. Um, it's uh, also common for there to be a uh, mutually named director in some cases. So there might be a director who is considered independent from the company and its investors, or who is uh, mutually appointed um, by agreement between the company and um, the past, uh, let's say, capital investors, um, there there are many different ways to do it, and you know, obviously, every every situation is different. But the general trajectory should be um, the founders start controlling the board, and little by little, as a lot of capital is raised, the investors start to control the board. Uh, now, advisors, you should really have from the very start, in my opinion. Um, you know, these are people who are uh, who are very experienced, 
who are known in the market, who have connections, who can help you meet the right people. And generally, uh, these folks are compensated with stock. Um, their stock should always be subject to vesting. Um, so that means if they end up, you know, leaving or you end up terminating your advisory relationship with them for some reason or another, they don't walk away with that percentage of their stock. The vesting makes sure that they are roped in for some specific period of time. Uh, four years is, is about standard, but it could be less, it could be more. Um, but make sure, you know, those are really people who are worthwhile and who, you know, you can really tout and because they're known in the market as being involved in your company. So I hope that answers the question. That's great. I, I actually just shared um, in the uh, chat feature. Um, the Founders Institute has a very nice template. They call it a FAST, which is, I don't know, it's an agreement for, for advisors. Anyway, there's an annex there, which is, um, which is very uh, helpful. Liz, in terms of um, equity that um, the either directors or um, advisors get, what are the ranges that you see um, the, founders get, the founders giving to those advisors? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yes, obviously it depends on the, um, you know, how much of a heavyweight this advisor is. Uh, but I've seen, you know, I think a normal range would be anywhere from 0.5 uh, to 4 to 5% of the company if it's a uh, advisor who is really putting in a lot of work. Um, but I would say, you know, average tends to be about 1 or 2% at the beginning. It, it might be. Less. Yeah. Yeah, and, and th there's an annex um, to the uh, template that I sent, which um, I think uh, it's very actionable. It, all, it literally just breaks down the stage of the company, three different stages of the company, three different sort of commitments in terms of time for the advisor, for the director. And then it sort of gives you a, a, a range of equity that um, you might want to consider offering. So it's almost like it becomes very... Um, it's sort of a very interesting template. Um, Liz, there's a question. Do you recommend, is it wise um, to have a lawyer do work for the company for free in exchange for equity? What's your sense um, in terms of the issues there? So remember, uh, if, if you have a smart lawyer, um, they are going to want to make sure that the risk they're taking by uh, taking equity in your company as opposed to a cash payment for their services um, it you know, compensates um, uh, the work that they're putting in and, and the um, uh, cost benefit analysis that they're actually you know, losing out on the opportunity to um, earn cash for their services. Um, so what they will do is they will make sure that it is a, a pretty sizable chunk of equity um, that would be worth more uh, eventually if, if your exit occurs um, or if they are able to sell their stock later, um, far more um, than the, the cash value of their services. That's the only way it makes sense for any lawyer to take equity. Um, so you have to decide, um, you know, we, um, a lot of um, our best clients are, you know, coming to us from large law firms that do have a practice of taking equity. And, um, you know, once their commitment to the lawyers run out, they realize that, um, you know, they've given away a large chunk of their company because the, the firms that, that um, more frequently take equity do charge pretty high hourly rates. And, um, you know, they've realized it's really not worth um, the cost, especially um, once they have the cash to pay lawyers. So um, it's up to you. Make sure you look at the numbers. Um, you know, I, I, I had a, a, a client the other day say, I never do business with lawyers because they're, they're playing on their home turf, right? Um, if they're taking equity in your company, they know your documents, they know the value of the equity that they're taking. Um, I, I would, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you really um, have no cash to pay um, decent lawyers, um, you know, okay, think about it, but, but, but tread carefully is my advice. Yeah, I would, I would just add in there that um, what I've seen um, can work better than that often in terms of making the process efficient is as you're building your advisory board, typically I don't recommend there was a time maybe 10 years ago that if you had a real splashy advisory board, it really helped with fundraising. The reality today um, is that um, investors don't really value the advisory board that much. Um, so what's really important is how much support will this advisory board be giving you all as investors? And so one thing, um, one of our clients um, 
uh, Latina uh, led company. Um, she has a woman on her advisory board who has helped, you know, she was at a venture fund, very, very experienced on legal issues. And what that advisor does is really is an interface with the lawyers to make sure that the lawyers are working as efficiently um, and, and, and as efficiently as possible and bringing the most value to the table. And so it's, it's interesting because even though um, this advisor is not a lawyer, she's so experienced in dealing with lawyers that um, she's saving the company, I could imagine, you know, the, the company, if they didn't have her, might be spending double or triple in terms of legal fees because this advisor, one, can help point um, the founder in the direction of, you know, sort of resources online where they don't even really have to com consult with lawyers or they can just um, pull some templates, make sure that it's, okay, it's um, those templates work for the lawyer and then, um, and then move forward. So I would just point out that, um, you know, it isn't sort of a, a, a completely binary choice. Okay, lawyers, you know, I'm gonna have to pay full rack rate or I get the lawyer to do the work for free. One, firms like ours often will work a, somewhat on a hybrid model and then two, if you bring advisors to the board of advisors of the company, people who have a lot of experience in terms of managing lawyers and fundraising, you can save a, a huge amount of money. Um, quick question. Um, what about arrangements between co-founders and early employees? I mentioned that one of the things, Liz, that investors are constantly worried and focused on is... Um, the cap table. What are the kinds of issues that you see over and over again um, in terms of the cap table that will cause good companies to sometimes fail? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you should um, you should have command of your cap table from the start. Um, you know, we as attorneys uh, often get asked to manage our clients' cap tables, and we're happy to do so. Um, uh, but oftentimes, it's because the client just doesn't want to deal with it. They don't want to know. Um, and then they're surprised when they raise around and uh, discover, you know, they agree to certain terms and they discover, for example, what the dilution will be. What I really suggest um, as a good investment of your time and resources is uh, to sit down with your lawyer and have them walk you through the cap table. The cap table, um, let me be very clear, it is not a legal document. It has to be memorialized in your legal documents, but it is really a historical record of um, all the transfers of ownership in your company. Um, and that's that's your asset, right? That's your primary asset. That is what you are really working your tail off um, to grow day in and day out. So you really need to know what you own. And you only know that if you understand the cap table. Um, so uh, there are um, some good online resources. Um, Juan Pablo mentioned Cooley Go for some other documents. They also have um, very good simple um, initial cap tables that you can look at. Um, once you get, um, you know, once you've done a round or two, um, I really suggest using an online uh, cap table such as Carta. Um, these, there is sort of a learning curve in uh, putting your cap table on one of these online resources, but they do end up uh, being a good investment of your money in that they are a source of truth rather than sending around Excel spreadsheets among uh, your founders and your lawyers. You have one source of truth, which is um, that online platform. Um, it's, it's, again, I, I can't stress enough, really important for you to know um, what's on your cap table and have a, a good orderly file of signed legal documents um, that evidences all the transfers of equity in your company. Um, believe me, when you get a, an institutional investor, when you get a VC fund interested, that is the first thing they're going to want to see. They're going to want to see your cap table and they are want, going to want to see the documents behind all the numbers that appear on your cap table. So um, keep your documents in order. Um, it can save you a lot in legal fees um, and um, avoid uh, embarrassing mishaps with investors. Yeah, um, somebody asked um, when it comes to privacy, what happens when the data is provided um, to CARDA? I'll, I'll maybe um, take that. Yeah, um, look, it, the reality is every time a company raises money in the United States, it has to file a form Reg D um, with the SEC. That's how platforms like um, TechCrunch or Crunchbase and others um, are able to amalgamate 
that data to allow um, entrepreneurs and investors to, to mine that data. So the data, a lot of the data is already out there. Yes, it's uh, Carta, um, you're, you're providing them um, fairly you know, confidential information. Um, there haven't, to my knowledge, been privacy breaches on data of Carta or on Pulley, which is their sort of competitor, which is a Y Combinator company. Um, but you should you should talk with them. I included in the um, in the uh, chat um, a link where um, you can get a discount on Carta if you use that link. Um, I'm also sharing the other thing um, that that we often um, see come up is that um, once founders take money from investors, they sometimes don't um, appropriately inform investors in terms of what's going on at the company. And so I've shared um, uh, an, a, 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 an online tool for building um, in, investor engagement um, with the company. So I, I, uh, it's, it, I, it's called Visible VC, it's just the tool um, that many of our clients use. And I'd encourage um, each of you to um, consider you know, using because often sometimes friction with investors comes from the fact that investors feel like, with founders that they give the money and then they don't get very many updates. Founders, on the other hand, often, you know, response to that is, hey, I'm heads down. I can't spend my day preparing investor updates. And so these tools sort of simplify um, that. There's another question, Liz, regarding SaaS-based businesses um, that when you're multi-jurisdictional, um, obviously, as an early stage company, you're not in a position to, you know, sort of hire brand name lawyers in, you know, every country where you might be selling. So what kind of advice, how do you, you know, do the cost benefit analysis in terms of trying to have, um, trying to be efficient in terms of um, spending on lawyers or advisors, um, but then also just being, being recognizing that you don't also want to be in a um, situation where you charge into a country and then realize later you violate a whole bunch of local laws. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, your contracts don't necessarily have to be governed by the law of the country in which you do business. This is your commercial contracts. So if you are uh, located in Florida, um, you can have your contracts really with clients all over the world governed by Florida law. Um, the issue uh, really is, uh, you know, for the most part, this is a privacy concern. Um, when you are reaching um, customers and you're collecting data and you have users, let's say you're an app, um, you don't know where your users are. They can be anywhere around the world. Um, clearly, unless you're Microsoft, it's not feasible to hire uh, a lawyer in every major country of the world to make sure you comply with the data privacy regulations of every country. Um, the sort of the cheat to this, not, not really the cheat because it'll get you covered 90% you know, of the time, is to make sure you comply with the most stringent data privacy regulations. Um, the um, GDPR, which is Europe's uh, privacy regulation came out a few years ago. Um, and at the time, um, and still is one of the most stringent privacy policies or privacy regulations in the world. Um, it, what, does, what does compliance mean? It means that you, um, not uh, under the GDPR, not only that you have you know, that privacy notice on your website, that every company has, um, but you also have an internal privacy policy. And very importantly, you follow that privacy uh, policy. So you have a policy which is distributed to all your employees and contractors, which states exactly how you are going to handle um, personally identifiable information and everyone follows it. And your privacy policy on your website really shouldn't be cookie cutter. It should be customized to uh, reflect the way that your company does business. Um, if you comply with the GDPR and you comply with the privacy laws in California, which are more recent, but also considered the most uh, restrictive in the nation, then you should generally be okay in most cases. And, and this is a, a area where it does, um, it does benefit you to spend a little bit of money with an attorney and get the pri internal privacy policy and the privacy notice for your website Right, because this is really something that does have to be customized and tailored to the nature of your business. Yeah, I think what's key there, um, I, I, I agree, there in, in venture for a long time, and I think it was sort of most um, evident with, with Uber's philosophy of that it's better to ask forgiveness and permission 
Um, I think there are some sectors where, um, you know, founders are sort of just willing to say, okay, I'm complying with, you know, U.S. regulations, that should be good enough in X country, in Mexico. Um, what founders have found out in more regulatory, regulated sectors like fintech, um, you, know, you really do have to actually spend money on, on attorneys or, as I suggested, uh, sign a commercial agreement with a third party, which is offering sort of the regulatory rails, the regulatory infrastructure. But if you do um, try to sort of outsource, you need to make sure you own the, um, the customer information. I'm going to do, I've, we've had a couple questions around um, uh, how to uh, fundraise um, or how to identify um, opportunities. And I just want to give, share you all very quickly. I'm sharing my screen with Crunchbase. As I mentioned, every time a company raises money in the United States, they need to uh, file a form Reg D with the SEC. And so I, for instance, have a company um, in the mental wellness space. We just raised um, uh, several million dollars. And um, if I were interested in fundraising, I could, for instance, in a, this platform, Crunchbase, it's $375 a year. I could do a search, for instance, for mental wellness company. Oh, sorry, here we go. Mental wellness companies. And they have a hub called Mental Wellness Startups. And here, let's see, recent rounds, um, Noom. Um, so let's say I'm a earlier stage company, Noom's in a series F. Noom, I see right here has raised $650 million in various rounds of financing. But I can see, for instance, who invested in their seed round. And here I can start seeing, you know, okay, if I were in, as a mental wellness company, I'd wanna find out who at Qualcomm, who at MA, who at Harvard Pacific invested in Noom because those might be people I want to speak with. Um, for instance, here, this is Noom Series A round. And what's even nicer is I can see not only a little snapshot of who the investor was, but with some investors, I can even see who is the lead partner. So once I figure out who the lead partner was on that investment, I can go to LinkedIn, uh, hopefully, let's see, this gentleman is a managing partner here. Yes, that's the same. I can connect with him, great. I can write him a little something. But then what I can also do is there's a service called Rocket Reach. There's a bunch of services like this where I can literally for you know 10 cents a search, get his email address. So I can, for instance, here, it's, it's gonna hopefully um, show his email address, which please do not email him, but um, I'm just showing you all. And so, yeah, here are some email addresses that, um, that, that, that work. The reason I, I mentioned this is um, a lot of times founders will come to me and sort of say, oh, you know, what investors, um, can, do you recommend? And of course, I have a, I have a, you know, a, a list of um, investors. Liz works with a lot of investors, and sometimes we can make introductions that prove helpful. But um, by by appropriately using a tool like Crunchbase, you can literally have almost a, you know, an unlimited number of investors. My advice, however, is when you reach out to those investors, you don't reach out saying. Hey, here's a term sheet. You know, we're we're a, a you know great company in this space. Um, love to know if you're interested. What actually resonates much better with with investors is if you find an investor who seems to have invested in a couple of companies in your sector. So, say you're a B to C company or you're in the mental wellness space, and then you reach out to the investor and you say. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, for instance, in my case, I'm an entrepreneur in the mental wellness space. Um, uh, I, I see that you've invested in the following, you know, company or two companies. This is our company, New Life. Um, I see that you've invested in the following companies. Um, there, there's, I'd love to be able to have a conversation with you 
to discuss what are the, for instance, K key KPIs, the key performance indicators that we should be tracking as a company that's really beginning to scale in this space. You see how that kind of pitch is much more likely to resonate with somebody because you're not sort of trying to start the conversation very transactional, like I have something to sell and I'm hoping you'll buy this, but you're much more trying to start a conversation the way you would at a cocktail party, um, where you're trying to find a hook, where you demonstrate to that perspective, um, individual or investor or advisor, that, hey, what you're interested in is starting a conversation, building a relationship, and then seeing where that relationship would go. So anyway, I just mentioned um, TechCrunch as a tool that you can use very efficiently to come up with a list of investors. The last thing I would say about that is I always recommend that um, as an entrepreneur, you don't spray and pray too much. You sort of send out three or four um, emails, see if there's some reaction. If there isn't a reaction, tweak your message. It's a little bit like A-B testing. Tweak your message, send out another three or four, but never, never have more than four or five active conversations at any given point because it starts. It becomes very obvious um, to the people you're reaching out to that you're, you know, trying to have too many conversations at the same time. Maybe it's like, um, you know, online dating or something where it becomes clear when somebody's you know, just praying and praying and, you know, not really interested in building uh, deep relations. So um, anyway, I hope that little uh, uh, live demo um, was, was um, helpful. So Liz, uh, one last question before we end. Um, there's some questions about, um, uh, uh, about um, term sheets. How, how important, um, as you discuss with investors, it, do you think it's important to sort of have a term sheet to put on the table? Um, or how important is that? To, or, or, or is your recommendation that you let the investor sort of propose terms? What's your sense in terms of what uh, tends to work? Yeah, I think there's a perception out there that the term sheet is really something that the investor puts forth. Um, and when you are uh, dealing in later rounds, um, that is generally the case. Um, the investor um, has spoken with you. They, they know um, what they are willing to uh, invest in, in terms of the equity structure, the rights that they want, the valuation, and they will send you a term sheet. However, especially with more early stage companies, I generally do recommend that unless there is an investor who has you know, given them a very clear idea already of um, how they want the round to be structured, that they be proactive and come out with a term sheet. It doesn't have to be anything complicated, one or two pages, um, just laying out the, the terms. Um, I have uh, clients come to me and asking me, well, what's the value of the company? Yeah, that's not my, my area of expertise as a lawyer. No lawyer can tell you what the value is of your company. Um, it's your uh, responsibility as a founder to before you start talking with investors to you know as in any negotiation know what you're willing to accept know what you think your value of the company is just like a real estate transaction you look at the comparables you look at other companies um, of a uh, similar uh, size uh, similar quality of product um, same industry perhaps um, and you develop a case for why your company is worth x um, and then you think about how you want to raise that capital. Again, um, a lot of investors will start with equity. Um, investors generally like to receive preferred equity because it gives them a lot of rights. The problem with, if you're very early stage issuing preferred equity is um, A, it's quite costly. Um, we can document a safe round um, or a convertible note round um, generally for under $2,000. Um, an equity round, uh, can start at six for a more simple round and go up anywhere into you know forty fifty thousand dollars and for larger uh, law firms and those based in expensive markets like San Francisco and New York um, it could be much higher um, so we really like to advise our clients to raise money initially um, on convertible notes and safes um, especially for smaller rounds certainly rounds under a million dollars. Um, if you know that is what you would prefer, um, you want to save the legal costs, you want to save the headache of having these investors on your cap table, um, and you know what the valuation of your company is, um, you will, um, A, have a stronger negotiating position when you go talk to investors, 
And B, you're going to show them that you know what you're doing, that you've thought about things like valuation, um, which is going to leave them with a much better impression of you and um, more interest in doing business with you. I would also just point out, and this is um, you know, something um, that, that we see literally on a daily basis, your comparable is not likely the, um, the headline um, that you saw in um, Crunchbase or TechCrunch the day before. So it is funny because, you know, for instance, companies that are pre-seed, the reality is um, those companies tend to raise money you know, between a million to $3 million valuation or cap, right? Um, sometimes, you know, for, for founder, and, but, but you will always see that there's a founder, a company that sort of breaks the rule. And those are the companies that are often highlighted um, in TechCrunch um, or in Wired Magazine. And so one thing that is very important um, is I, I, I really, you know, recommend that as you think about what your comparable is, and not to say that each of you aren't extraordinary, but you have to sort of recognize that um, TechCrunch is not where the, the vast majority of companies, or is not the comparable for where the vast majority of companies are raising. Um, there's sort of a reason those um, companies get highlighted in TechCrunch, but so there is often this, this gap where, you know, founders will sort of read those valuations and you don't know, I mean, this is a conversation Liz and I have, uh, unfortunately on a, you know, weekly, if not sometimes daily basis, the founder comes like, oh, I want to do a series B. Um, I'm in a very hot sector. I want to raise uh, 15 million at a $50 million valuation. Great. And then we say, okay, and what, what, what's your revenues look like, et cetera. Again, not that we're, you know, we're not the investment banker, um, and investment bankers don't exist in this space, but you know we're trying to get a sense of where the company is in its development. And then they'll say, "Oh, we have you know fifty thousand dollars a month of, of revenues," and it's just like. And then we say, "Well, in our experience, you know, companies with that kind of revenue generally aren't able to you know do that kind of raise." And then they'll say, "Oh, but we just saw such and such company in TechCrunch just raised in a hundred million dollar valuation." So we're a relative bargain. And my only advice is, um, if that works for you, great. Just keep in mind that every time you raise money, you're expected to double or triple the valuation from the last raise. And so you know, the higher valuation you raise, the higher the expectations are for the next round. And that's why 80% of companies that raise money from Silicon Valley-based funds end up going under, 80%. And that's because those valuation expectations um, are very hard to meet. And so many founders don't, founders aren't able to meet them, double or triple the valuation. So that means if you raise at a $10 million valuation today, when you're next in the market, you're gonna be expected to be at a 20 to $30 million valuation, not more. And so you have to be very careful um, to understand that. So with that, I think um, we've answered um, we're, we're at the hour mark. We really appreciate Marion and All Rise um, time here. And, um, you know, thank you so much for everything you all are doing. And again, if anyone wants to get involved with We Invest, um, connecting um, female investors throughout the Americas with a focus on Latin America, please reach out to, uh, to Liz or to me. We're very happy to uh, support everything that All Rise is doing. And, um, we're happy to continue the conversation with any of you offline. Yes, thank you so much, Lizbeth and Juan Pablo. Wow, the gems dropped and all the learnings that I had myself. So I'm sure the founders through the questions got a lot of out, out of it too. Um, so thank you again for your time. I look forward to continuous conversations. Um, and for the audience, please give us your feedback. We'd love to hear what you loved, what you didn't love, and what are some other conversations and events that you would like to learn more about that helps us um, have more events like the one we had today. So thank you again to the both of you. Um, really appreciate your time and just the knowledge sharing today and the, 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 the length of the Q&A, just very, very helpful. So thank you. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thanks everyone. We're here to help. Thank you. Sounds good. Well, take care. Cheers. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.